conceptual Jay sounded better than Jay Preach. People talk Real about talk, it. I ain't throwing shots. All of the elements. Hello, everybody. Dr. Rick Wallace here, dropping in on you. Uh, I don't plan on being too long, but then again, you guys know me. I'd like to be thorough in what I'm explaining. I want to talk briefly about the economic impotence of the Black collective as a whole. Uh, we tend, as a people, to live our lives vicariously through those who are successful. That's why we have such an emotional connection to celebrities and athletes that when someone does something to them or says something about them, we really get up in our feelings because we live our lives vicariously through those who have made it through the orifices and cracks of institutional racism. And it is, and it has been for a long time, the uh, practice of those in power to parade the talented 10th, so to speak, those successful black people in front of the masses as an explanation and a justification for the holding back of others by saying, if they made it, you should be too. We have been told over and over again that we must pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps, but we are aware if we've put in our work, if we've done our research, we know very well that it takes more than just pulling yourself up by your bootstraps to find yourself on equal footing. And so we have to, we have to approach things like that. But what I want to talk to you about is not so much institutional racism, but the enemy within. See, there's an old African saying that says that there's no enemy on the inside, the enemy on the outside can do you no harm. And what that means is that when you prepare yourself, when you look at where your weaknesses are, where you're consistently being attacked, and you decide within yourself you're going to shore up those weaknesses and make them strengths, that you're no longer going to be prodded and moved and manipulated in those areas. You, you begin to read, you begin to learn. But more importantly, one of the things we've got a lot of now is knowledge, but we don't have a lot of activity. We don't have a lot of proactivity. We don't have a lot of activity and action in the areas of the knowledge we know. We like to regurgitate it. We got plenty of speakers moving around telling us all of these wonderful things about ourselves and the possibilities and the things and the strategies and all of this. But we have no unity. We don't operate. There's this monster on the inside called self-hatred. And self-hatred drives this pulse or, 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 or this force that says, I would rather buy white than to buy black. And I can find every reason in the book not to support my own. And uh, I, 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 uh, I haven't been... Uh, successful in business for a number of years in a number of different ways, understand how businesses flow. And one of the things that is required for business is funding. And the wonderful thing about funding is when people are training you in business and they're saying, okay, you need to get funding. The first thing that everybody else teaches those people in their racial collective about funding is tap into what is known as the hot market or the hot source. And those are your family and friends. You contact your family. People have literally funded businesses, launched those businesses from money given to them by their family. Now I can tell you that doesn't work well in the black collective because family's gonna be the hardest person, I mean the hardest group of people to convince that what you have going is worth investing in. Family is going to be the hardest group of people to sit up and want to see you succeed. So you got a lot of people in your family that will like to see you succeed. As long as succeeding doesn't mean that you transcend them in any particular area that they, could, they perceive to be important to them. And that goes for friends and associates as well. See, people are all day long saying they want you to do well. What they mean is you can do good as long as you don't do better than me. So what we have is a bunch of people 
who are willing to say, okay, if I think this person has the capacity to do better than me, to explode and to expand, I don't want to have anything to do with them. I'm not talking about going to businesses that don't know how to conduct businesses. I'm talking about legitimate business ideas, some of which who haven't gotten off the ground. Other business minded individuals and entrepreneurs who have a good program, a good product, a good service model, and are doing great things, but can't get any support from the community. I'm talking about them. I'm talking about people who can't go to their families and ask their families to back them on it. Now, I've had some support from my family, but I'll tell you this to give you a, a real honest look at it. With the support I've got from my family, it's been minimal, and I'll show you how. In one business endeavor, just one, I've done 47 in my lifetime, in one, and that's just writing books. I've written 20. I haven't sold 20 books within my family. I've sold thousands, but I haven't sold 20 within my family, and I can go on and on and on about the different things that I've done in business and have not been able, and the thing is, you know, Family wants this counts. Family wants this. And that means you don't understand business. If I am an individual or a small business owner, I don't have the volume to compete with larger businesses to compete on price. So there's a good chance my prices are going to be a little bit higher than the chain store up the street or someone who has better connections. Now, as I get my business going and I grow my business and I develop connections in manufacturing and distribution, if I'm dealing with a hard product, now, if I'm dealing with services, then I'm looking for ways to leverage and deliver my services in a more efficient manner. And if that's the case, once I do that, once I'm able to tap into technology and afford a uh, uh, more functional technology, then I'll be able to deliver my product or my service in a less expensive and more affordable way. But what you've got to understand is we're the only group that does not have a hot market. We can't fund our business endeavors by calling family and family members. And, that, and it's not just because family won't support us. We also have to look at the fact that the uh, median household wealth for blacks is so low that there's not 15, 20, $30,000 sitting around in the average black bank account. So we understand that, but that's why we have to function as a whole collective. And, and, and so it's not just about family. It's about seeing something and understanding that I can be, and I can speak for myself and I can speak for a number of other black people who have experienced success. People I talk with on a daily basis, people I've worked with over the last 30 years. This is what I can tell you is that no matter how successful I've been, I've still been black. Not just because I want to own my blackness, but because they remind me of it. No matter how much money I get, I'm never going to be them. I don't want to be them, but there are a bunch of us who think that our money will make us, uh, put us in an equal footing. Now, they will allow us to come into the fold and use us. They will parade us around in front of others who don't do well, who are struggling, who are trying to find their footing, who know that they're giving it everything they've gotten. They're constantly being told, just go to work, work some more hours, get a second job, do all of this. But it never seems to add up to getting out of a financial crunch. Why? Because that's not the answer. They know the answer. The answer is finding the right leverage to do the right thing, whether it's at a job, whether it's on your own as a business owner, whether it's an idea, whether it's a service, whether it's a product, whether it's a new innovation, it requires that kind of thinking and then the financial backing to make it happen. Now, what has happened year after year after year, long before slavery ended and definitely after slavery ended, is that everything we created with our unbelievable creativity, our unbelievable innovative thinking, our unbelievable ideas, they've taken from us. They built the, they've taken the patents, they put the patents out on things we've created, they've stolen ideas uh, and, and on down the line. And that's because we were not in a position to protect our intellectual property. We were not in a position to fund our ideas. We were not in a, in, in, in a, in a uh, position to take an unbelievable business that provides an unbelievable service and scale it. Why? Because the number one funding source is within us and we don't do that. And that is something that we've really got to change. We really have to do a better job of supporting black businesses. And 
you know, I've heard crazy things when I talk to people about this. You know, uh, I believe that we need to, when we're providing services, uh, and I'm one, when I provide services, what I do for, for, for my people in the way of service pricing is different. And people say, well, that's not fair. Everybody does it to us. Everybody looks out for themselves. You go to any other community, Asians look out for Asians. You don't pay the same price for anything you buy from Asians that Asians are paying for it, trust me. You don't do that in the Jewish community. You're not gonna see it in the Hispanic community. You're not gonna see it in the Arab community. And you're definitely not gonna see it in the white community. The same stores that you're going in paying full price, and I know this because I learned this and was able to put it into play because I spent enough money in certain places. There are places, retail places, you're going into and you're paying full price that white people are not going in and paying that same price because they're going to go in and they're going to ask and they're going to get a discount on it. And that's what happens with, and it's happening in every industry, in every market, and it happens across all racial lines. Racial groups support each other. We feel like we've got to play fair with everybody. Nobody's playing fair with us. And then we won't black one, we won't back, back one another. It really, 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 really bothers me. Uh, while I'm thinking about it, there's a link in here called Blueprint. Uh, I think I put the Blueprint. Uh, no, I didn't put the link in there. I'm going to put the link in after that, but it's called the Blueprint 1.0. 1, 1. And it's about complete economic empowerment, complete advancement and empowerment of the race and what it takes place on a strategic level. But the one thing that has to happen is before we can move strategically, we've got to be moving in harmony. We've got to be moving in, in, in unison, there has to be a unity and a collective power. Our power is in our collectivity. As long as we're trying to, everybody's trying to do this. This business owner's over here doing this. This business owner's over here doing this. This person is trying to start this school. This person is trying to open this daycare. This person, everybody's doing it, but nobody's working together. There's no unity, there's no collectivity, there's no network. There's no collective network on a, lo on a community, local, state, and national level where everything is intricately connected and everybody is feeding into everybody's business. There's no responsibility on black business ownership as well. On the flip side of things, uh, when I created uh, 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 the Black Business Business Owners uh, SSPE, which is an investment group now, when I first created it, the idea was to find black businesses that would be willing to move at least one location into a black community. And then to get the black community to support that business in lieu of supporting an Asian, Arab, or white business in their community that did the same thing. And what I did is when I started talking to these businesses, the first thing I said is there's a requirement that a certain percentage of your profits be put back into the community. And you will not get to choose what that money goes towards. Based on the needs of the community, you're going to be required to put a certain percentage of your profits back into that community based on the needs. When you sign your contract, we will look at the need at that time and that will be your designation. That's where that money has to go, whether it's business development, residential development, education, uh, drug uh, rehabilitation, health, all of these things that are necessary to operate within the community, to build the community, to make the community strong. We feel that any business that's operating and benefited from that community has a responsibility. Now, honestly, I also believe that every church should be held accountable in the black community to be responsible for a certain portion of the cost of upkeeping and elevating that community. I believe that if you're pulling money out of any situation, you have to be bringing value back into it. And so my whole thing is I have seen on my timeline and something has hit close to home where family members know they have a family member who is doing something in the community or doing something in business and they have a need in that area and they will go outside of that family member and what makes it worse is when they go outside of that family member and they go to someone else of a different race to get it done and then brag about it as if doing it with someone other than a black person makes them better. I have a major problem with that. And anybody who understands how this works. Now, my thing is, as an individual, you got a right to do what you want to. You have a right to marry who you want to. You have a right to do business with who you want to. But if we're talking about building a strong black community, then that's a thing called accountability and responsibility. 
It's not just what I want to do. It's what's going to be best, not just for myself, but what's best for the community. That is something that we're going to really have to visit. That's something that we're really going to have to put a lot of stock into is truly getting really rid of the enemy on the inside. A lot of that comes from this entrenched self-hatred that tells us inherently that the white man's ice is cold. That because someone is not black, that their product, their service, their business is better. What I can tell you is some of the best businesses that are delivering services right now are black owned. They're delivering quality product or service, quality customer service, and they are delivering at an extremely high level. Now, the thing is, if they are like me, they're having to find the vast majority of their revenue outside of the black community. And while I believe that there's a need for that, I believe that there has to be businesses that are black owned that provide services that don't necessarily uh, focus in on the black community. Why? Because our community has been raided by businesses since, since the, we started having communities. Other businesses come in, take the black dollar out and haul ass and never look back. We never see the dollar again. It's never reinvested. It never recycles. It never comes back in. We're going to have to go into other economic uh, uh, climates, uh, Asian, Arab, uh, white, whatever, and pull out money by providing a reasonable good service to them, something that they are willing to pay for. And if you're good at what you do, and you deliver it in a way that nobody else can deliver it, they'll pay for it. I, I, I can attest to that. And they'll pay top dollar for it if you're bringing value. That's another thing that we've got to focus on. We've got to learn how to educate ourselves, to prepare ourselves, to develop a high skill level so that we can go into other economies and deliver a service or a product at a level that nobody else can, regardless of race, and get that money. Now, the thing is, we've got to have a mindset with a responsibility that, yes, I need to provide a life and a future for my family, but I also have a responsibility for the whole. Why? Because the stronger the whole is, the safer the wealth I build for my family. I can't get into that in great detail, but you have to understand that. The way that white wealth has been protected, it isn't just that there is white people with wealth. It's that there is this collective machine operating and there are these buffering mechanisms that protect wealth that are in the hands of the wealthy. And we have to build that. We have to build that type of thing to where we're strong in areas across the board. Just having 10% of our collective having money and the other 90% struggling is never going to be good for the 10. Why? Because at any time, there's nobody to protect you. Anytime they want to take something or harm you or come at you, they will, as Bill Cosby. And this isn't me defending Bill on what he did. This is me saying that it was all good until he stepped on the wrong toe or somebody got ticked off. And it was nothing that a cushion. This is the worst part. And then I'm going to be done. How many of our leaders that we walk around posting memes about right now, the John Henry Clarks, the Joseph Binyakinans, the Malcolm X, the Martin Luther Kings, and uh, the Francis Crest Wells, all these, how many died broke because they gave everything they had to the Black Collective and the Black Collective didn't give a damn? They took it, ran with it, repackaged it, tried to call it their own, and never loved them enough to make sure they were good. When Dr. Uh, ben Yakinen died, Dr. Ben, when he died, he was in a nursing home in New York. There were a couple of people, students of his, that he, that, had, that, that he had touched their lives that looked after him. But what was the Black collective? This brother, this brother should have been taken care of in the best possible way for the contributions that he gave. You know, uh, and we could talk on and on and on. What was Betty Shabazz living when she died because her grandson set the apartment on fire? That's the wife of Malcolm X. And we've deified this man. But we didn't take care of his family. You want to know why 
it's hard to get black people to really commit to coming in and doing the work is because black people won't underwrite them. Black people won't hold them up. When the heat gets hot, black people will throw them under the bus and leave them out there. That self-hatred right there is the problem. All of these black businesses, I mean, I've seen black businesses, real estate agency. Uh, 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 I mean, we've got some unbelievable fitness trainers, male and female. And that's a passion for mine because that was business number one for me. And I know that that market is set up to just totally go up. But I can tell you that the vast majority of my clientele, when I did it, were, were, were white. Now we're getting where more of us see the value in it. But now the, 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 the industry I'm in now, personal improvement, personal development. You know, I don't have any problems with my pricing with, with, with other people outside of the race. Black people come in, they trying to they divide and work calculus and everything to lower the price and you don't see the value. And this isn't about me trying to get you to see the value of what I do. This isn't even about my business. I'm just talking about, in general, what I can talk about from experience. So when I want to focus on delivering something to my people that I know will bless them, I have to automatically equate it to taking money out of my pocket because it will never be, what I'm giving will never be equated with what I get. And what I get is very little. And so... What I want to leave you with is this. Whatever you need, your first option should be searching for a black business owner who does it. Now, I'm not telling you go out and get no crappy stuff. That's not what I'm telling you. I'm telling you to get what your money can afford at the best, but try and find it with a black owned business and then try to vet the owner, you know, find out. Are you just a black person who owns a business or are you a true black business owner? Do you have a black mindset? Are you looking to grow the black community? Or are you looking just to get rich because you black off the black dollar? Now that's a difference and you need to know that, but you also need to know who's pouring into the community, who's giving their soul in what they do in their business, whether it's a real estate agent, whether it's a physician, whether it's a dentist, whether it's a personal fitness instructor or a nutritionist, uh, uh, no matter what it is, if they're giving their soul and you can tell it, you can sense it, you can feel it. Uh, one of my business partners, Will, his wife, Calvis, is doing some unbelievable stuff in health and in 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 in, in, in nutrition and in, in, in herbs and in soaps and all these different things and she puts her heart and her spirit into it and you want to support people like that you know and, and and my thing is again am i aware of the white racist system the right racial caste system uh that's that's in place right now am i aware of the institutional mechanisms that have been in place yes i've written books about uh the reconstruction area, black codes, convict leasing, redlining, urban renewal, benign neglect, uh, Jim Crow, uh, mass incarceration, gentrification, uh, miseducation. I've written books on it. I've written numerous articles. I've written scholarly papers on it. So yes, I know it exists. But let me explain something to you. I believe this with all my heart, that where there is no enemy within, the enemy on the outside can do you no harm. They are effective because we have all of these cracks in the way we love on each other, the way we treat each other, the way we stand with each other, the way we work with each other, the way we will. But there is no loyalty in the black collective. So yes. Yes, yes, yes. I'm, I'm very aware. I'm very much aware of it. I, I, I've i dealt with it. I, I mean, I've put in right now anything dealing with the black collective, all of the issues from the psychopathologies to the trauma, to the economic impotence, to everything else we've dealt with. I've put in over 80,000 hours of research into understanding it over the course of my life. 80,000 hours. And I'm still researching and still trying to learn. So yes, I understand that there's a racial caste system operating against us on a daily basis. I understand that there's uh, empirical data out there right now that says that people are being disqualified on their application simply by having a name that's being identified as being ethnic. I, I, I know that to be true. I've researched that. I've reviewed it and I looked at it. 
I know that happens. I know that there are at least 12 police departments in the United States right now in which the head people in that department have been identified as targeting black people who are not guilty and pinning crimes on them for all types of reasons. Alabama, Florida, Pennsylvania, all of this is happening. I'm aware of it. I'm aware of some of the things that go on in the academic arena. I'm aware of it. I'm aware of what's going on in corporate America. This is what I'm saying. I'm saying that we are so creative. We're so innovative. We're so resilient. We're so powerful that if we ever got rid of the enemy within, that wouldn't matter. We're our own worst enemy. Am I saying ignore it? Am I saying ignore what's going on in the public school system? Am I saying ignore what's going on in the justice system? No, I'm not saying ignore it. I'm saying put yourself in a better position to combat it, to overcome it, to fight it. You gotta have a collective mindset. You can't move against the collective machine on an individual premise. That's why when you get something that happens to your family, you're standing out there alone with a few people with a picket sign because there's no collectivity. That's why when Mike Brown was shot down, we had black people in the street, but Mike Brown had 500,000 plus in his bank account in less than three, in, in less than three months. I mean, not Mike Brown, uh, Darren Wilson. That's the difference in two groups. The group offended, Picket signs. The offending group looking to stand next to and make sure that whoever they can insulate, they will put uh, close to 600000 the last I checked, into Darren Wilson's account. And that's happened over and over again with multiple violators of people of color. And yet the families of these people are struggling and suffering. There's not the same loyalty, the same self-love, the same understanding of what's happening place on a racial level. We've got to do better. Uh, like I said, I'm going to put uh, the link to the blueprint uh, on this post as soon as I get off to make sure it's there. But I just wanted to stop, but I'm just sitting up and I'm looking and I see it over and over again. And I, and I can understand the frustration of people who can't even depend on their families to support it back. I mean, if you got somebody that's a trainer in your family, go to that person and let them train you. If you got somebody who's a dentist in the family, that's what needs to be doing your teeth. If you got somebody who is a real estate agent. That's who you should be taking your business to. That's who you should be looking when it's time to invest in. You should be talking about investing in real estate, not just where you're going to live, but the things you're going to do in building wealth. You should be talking about it. That should be that conversation should be held with the family member in your family who does real estate. That that's how you work together. I, I see, I've seen it a couple of times, but we've got to learn how to build together, grow together, stand together. Nobody should be. Anybody with siblings, parents, cousins, and, and, and the like, you know, you got some people that don't have family. I mean, literally, life was just so screwed up that they grew up without family. They ended up getting displaced, put in foster care, getting adopted, whatever, and they don't have family. But in the sense of uh, this is this is uh, the, the the thing is. Those of us that have family, those of us that have family, we should be working together to build together. I mean, unify, buying property together. And, and there's a thing you can do called an unincorporated business trust. It's also known as a Massachusetts trust. And it, 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 it's, it's a way of uh, building a trust, a board of trustees who can work to collect money, to invest money, to hold money, and that money isn't taxed until it's paid out in the form of a dividend to the shareholders or to the uh, contributors. And so look up an unincorporated business trust. I love it because of the way it works. It works much like a corporation, except there's no double tax. If, you, if you've ever had a corporation, if you ever run a corporation, you know there's a double tax involved. Well, that doesn't happen with uh, an unincorporated business trust, uh, but you should research it. But so families should be building business trusts. Every family should be a business. Every black family should be a business.
you know, uh, if you're really serious about doing this, email me or inbox me. And we can set up times to sit up and look at who your family is or look at what your group is. And if you can't do it with a family, find people in your community that, 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 that have like minds and, and, and get with them and say, hey, let's do this. And then you get up and you do it and you put together this business trust and you can grow it as large as you want to and manage it. I, I kind of treat an unincorporated biz, business trust much in the same way hedge fund, hedge fund managers treat hedge funds. I don't like them to get too big because the larger they get, the more accumulated, the harder it is to move things if there's a need to move it. So you've got to be able to manage it. So you, you want to build it to a capacity that's manageable. And that depends on who you got running it. The right person running it can grow it pretty huge, but you can just always start a new, a new direction. You don't have to handle all of your business through one trust or one corporation if you decide to take the corporate route. But you've got to have these things. You've got to learn how to start protecting your money. You got to learn how to start using corporations as a means of paying a lot of the things you're paying out of your pocket with taxable income. I'm, I'm getting a little bit off, but I'm just talking about all the things that are there. It's there right now, but we've got to do better. We've got to make up in our minds that we're going to do better. We've got to make up in our minds that we're going to come together. The biggest thing that's hurting us is the self-hatred that creates this disunity. It's no way you got a family member doing something and you're off somewhere else in another race paying somebody to do it. Even if they don't have the expertise that that person has, that should be you coming and saying, what do you need to be that good? What do you need from us to be as good as them? What are you lacking right now? Is it money and resources? Is it access? Is it connected? Do you need me to connect you with some people? Whatever it is, you should be asking your family member, how can I get you on their level instead of running over there and bragging about being with them? It says, it speaks volumes to how you feel about yourself, honestly. Any chance, and I know my wife is the same way, any chance that we have to work with someone that looks like us, that's what we're going to do. Now, when we've got to do business in other places, we know how. And we handle our business in a way that keeps us in a place of respect so we can continue to do so. But the goal and the, and the desire would be to do our business with our people. We've got a lot of growing to do in that area. Look, I'm going to get off here, as I always say. I'm going to live my life on full so that I die on E. I'm challenging every last one of you to do the same thing. I'm going to get out of here. Uh, still got a lot of stuff to do, but I just had to drop that, uh, drop this on you. Hopefully, you'll take it, you'll share it, you'll think about it. But um, Visit the site, check it out, see some of the things were going on, but definitely read uh, this link I'm going to put in here about uh, the blueprint. You know, some the things we need to be looking at of what it's going to take to really grow us. With that being said, I'm out here. You guys have an unbelievable day. Hello everybody, Dr. Rick Wallace here, dropping in with a little special announcement. For those who have followed me for any stretch of time, you know outside of the businesses that I run, like Myriad Business Solutions, the Visionetics Institute, Odyssey Media Group, I also do a great deal of work inside of the inner city communities uh, in Houston, Dallas, and other areas. Uh, I'm asking now as we push a fundraiser that you support what the Odyssey Project is doing in the inner cities, uh, especially with programs like Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage uh, initiative, and Restoring Ghetto for, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, which is a program focused on helping young girls, but boys as well, suffering from childhood sexual abuse, uh, rape, molestation, domestic abuse, uh, absentee fatherhood, and so many other things. Uh, the information will be in the box. Thank you.
emotion made this record hot. From a conceptual standpoint, people talk about it. All of the elements.